Few have used their... Few have used their voice in more profound fashion to shape the global climate movement than His Holiness Pope Francis. In 2015, his landmark encyclical letter, La Dame, called on all peoples across the world to be stewards of creation and to remember the impact of clouds poorest. He not only helped make the Paris Agreement possible, but continued to bring his humble message of justice and solidarity to so many of the world leaders gathered here today. All throughout, His Holiness Pope Francis has stressed to build a global culture of care that attends to the human dignity of those souls most directly affected by the climate crisis. It's our great privilege to have His Holiness Pope Francis join us today. Buenos días. Saludo a ustedes que están vivos en esta iniciativa que me parece feliz. Una iniciativa que nos pone en camino a, todo, a toda la humanidad a través de su líder. Nos pone en camino en cuanto a caso. Pero más todavía en concreto, hacernos cargo de la custodia de la naturaleza, de ese don que hemos recibido y que tenemos que custodiar y llevar adelante. Adquiere una significación mucho más grande. Es un desafío que tenemos en esta pospandemia. Todavía no terminó, pero vamos, tenemos que mirar adelante. Crisis. Sabemos que una crisis no se sale igual. Nuestra preocupación es mirar que el ambiente sea más limpio, más puro, observe y cuidar la naturaleza para que ella nos cuide a nosotros. Les deseo éxito en esta decisión tan linda de encontrarse y caminando hacia adelante los acompaño. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Holy Father, for that very important and message. We're very grateful to you. It's my pleasure now to introduce to the breakout sessions Administrator Regan of the EPA and Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack and Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas. Uh, good day, everyone. I'm Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture of the States of America. And I'm certainly honored to be here moderating today's panel. Many thanks to President Biden and Vice President Harris for having the force commitment for creating this platform for discussion and collaboration. I want to thank all of the outstanding and impressive panel of ministers that have uh, across the globe who are with us today. It's fitting uh, that President Biden has asked uh, us to have this panel. The focus does, in fact, need to be on adaptation and resiliency. As agriculture, I am reminded daily those making their living from our farmers, our ranchers, our forest owners are bearing the brunt of climate change. Under the Biden-Harris administration, the Department of Agriculture is engaged in a whole of government effort to combat the climate crisis and serve and protect our nation's lands, biodiversity, and resources, including our soil, air, and water. Increasingly storms, devastating wildfires, droughts, floods, and hurricanes are causing billions of dollars in damage to the U.S. agriculture and forest industry every single year. And they are also posing a deep threat to human safety. Climate change is clearly already having an impact, which emphasizes the urgent need to adapt and be resilient to these changes. Now, this is true not only in the United States, but around the world. In 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a special report on the land sector. The report called out particular risks to people and land. Since the pre-industrial period, the land surface air temperatures have risen nearly twice as much as the gorge temperature. Climate change creates additional stresses on exacerbates existing risks to livelihoods, biodiversity, human and ecosystem health, infrastructure, and food systems. The good news is that we have strategies to address these challenges. The news is that many of the responses that build resilience and adaptation 
also contribute to mitigation and can combat desertification and land degradation, enhancing food security. This week, USDA is announcing three significant investments in the areas of conservation, science, research, and rural development. They all together represent nearly a billion dollars in investments to address and mitigate climate change. Chief among our announcements is a new effort to expand and rebuild our world's largest and most effective volunteer conservation program called the Conservation Reserve Program. Our goal is to enroll an additional 4 million acres into this program, which will capture 6 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, prevent 90 million of nitrogen and 33 million tons of sediment from running into our waterways each year. And we're prepared to invest up to $330 million each year for a 10 to 15 to make all of this possible. The improvements we're making to CRP demonstrate innovation. These types of strategies combined with innovative technologies will be critical in adapting to climate change while continuing to and make economic sense. Climate and land policies have the potential to conserve resources, amplify social resilience, support ecological restoration, and foster engagement and collaboration between shareholders and stakeholders. That's why we're here today, to learn from each other and to work together to solve these challenges. This month, President Biden released his budget for 2022. The budget highlights key investments to address climate change include building clean energy projects, investing in resilience and disaster planning, prioritizing environmental justice, and increasing investments in innovation and science. USDA, we propose to invest heavily in climate preparedness to support the health and resilience of public and private lands with investments in science and a greater ability to address catastrophic wildfires and supporting America's areas and their ability to cope with the changing climate. These investments should be innovation needed to adapt to climate change. The budget also reflects the United climate leadership internationally. It supports global climate action by $1.2 billion to contribute to the Green Climate Fund to help developing countries reduce emissions and adapt to climate change. The budget also proposes $480 million to support other multilateral climate initiatives, including 100 international climate adaptation programs. This is in addition to the $91 million from the Department of State and the U.S. Agency for International Development, which will be assisting developing countries in adapting to climate disruptions, expanding clean energy and reducing landscape emissions. We're investing in research to sustainably increase agricultural productivity, livelihoods, and adapt and build resilience to climate change, all while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and sequestering carbon. There'll be more news tomorrow on investments we'll make with our partners to strengthen agricultural research on, and climate, so stay tuned. The theme of today's session is managing water and a changing climate, safeguarding food security, and protecting public health and security from climate impacts. Change is likely to, to diminish continued progress on global food security to tackle these challenges. I want to take an opportunity now uh, to turn you over to Secretary of Homeland Security, Orlando, um, who will offer a statement in support of our efforts. It is a pleasure to speak with, with all of you today as we explore, innovate, and adapt to the realities of the climate emergency. Of homeland security, I am deeply aware of the impacts this both our national security and our collective global security. At the department, we must and we will do more to address the climate crisis. Under President Biden's leadership, we'll implement a new approach to climate change, adaptation, and resilience. And we will do so with a sense of urgency this problem demands. Further, we negative effects of climate change on people around the world, including vulnerable populations, creates additional migrant and refugee populations. It is vital, then, that we act to reduce emissions and to, to promote resilience and adaptation both as a department and with our partners, which is why I am excited to announce a series of new actions today. 
1st, I have launched a Department of Homeland Security Climate Change Group, a coordinating body at the highest leadership level. The Climate Change Action Group will include every senior leader from across the country and report directly to me in order to drive urgent action to a climate crisis. The scale of the emergency is only ready. We'll refocus and elevate our efforts. Second, today, the department published an important and ambitious request for information to the American people, focusing specifically on how the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, as it is commonly known, can ensure that its programs advance equity and increase resilience, especially among those who are deeply at risk from climate change impacts. The public can receive will help FEMA to perform its time-honored mission of helping people before, during, and after disasters under modern conditions. In the coming years, we will reorient FEMA so that it achieves its long-standing goal of building a culture of preparedness in the context of novel risks, above all those used by climate change. Finally, we are finding new opportunities across the department to promote environmental sustainability. For example, DHS, our department, is leading the way in the adoption of electric vehicles with the goal of electrifying 50 percent of our fleet by 2030. I afford that the Department of Homeland Security is a department of tackling the enormous challenges presented by climate change. Our partnerships will be the key to success. For too many years, too little has been done. Now is the time for action. I welcome this panel of ideas for how we can support each other and work together to reduce emissions, to create jobs, to help those among us, and to ensure that our nation and the world to build stronger and more resilient communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Because climate change is a global challenge, it obviously unites all of us, and we are in this together. I'm excited to kick off the discussion today, and I look forward to hearing from all of you on what your countries are preparing for these. I'm going to turn now to a set of questions, and starting with Mr. Van Nievenhout from the Netherlands. Uh, she is the Minister of Infrastructure and Water Management and also a uh, Commissioner from the Global Commission. Uh, Adam Minister, I guess I'd ask, what does adaptation and resilience ambition look like to you and what is needed to make these ambitions a reality? Well, you all, um, first I'd like to thank the Biden administration for hosting this leaders uh, summit climate. You really are taking action. Uh, since February, uh, Special Envoy Kerry has traveled the world to step up action on climate, not only ourselves, but also for our children and grandchildren. Exactly five years after the signing of the Paris Agreement, we now know better how to safeguard their future. We know that education is one side of the coin, and the other is climate adaptation. And we must ensure that we are all able to deal with change, that we protect ourselves against rising sea levels and degradation of fertile lands. Our cities can prosper because we can prevent floods and heat waves, and that we make our infrastructure resilient to extreme weather. All of this is about survival. And the good news is that investing in adaptation pays off. We're talking about the adaptation dividends, the economic imperative. In 2018, um, I initiated the Global Committee on Adaptation and found Ban Ki-moon, Kristalina Georgieva Gates, willing to co-chair its proceedings. And the message in the Commission's report is loud and clear. Investing the necessary $1.8 trillion in climate adaptation over the next 10 years could generate $7.1 trillion in net benefits. By hosting the first Global Adaptation Summit earlier this year, the government brought together more than 30 world leaders to re ambition on adaptation and resilience. And this was an adaptation action agenda that will guide our work decade of action. 
adaptation uh, by countries is hardest by climate change was actually a key topic at the summit. And on that issue, the Netherlands is ensuring that its debate is equally focused 50-50 on mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and I'd like to repeat uh, my Prime Minister Mark Rutte's call to the world at the climate adaptation. On adapting our economy, much of that is owed to on adapting our economy, much of that is owed to war ground. More than 40 others must be moved to war ground. More than 40 others must be moved. Our climate relocation, our climate relocation displaced people's trust is designed to harness multilateral support to bring security to these communities. Other coastal areas in Fiji are being fortified with nature-based echo walls of mangroves, vativa grass and boulders to protect from coastal erosion. We are piloting a parametric climate and disaster risk microinsurance product, which we hope can be scaled up in Fiji and to other small island developing states. We in fact launched a sovereign green bond in 2017 to fund climate-centric projects. Indeed, that bond is now listed on the London Stock Exchange. And we are now working on a blue bond with the United Kingdom for, for ocean action. With the USA back in the game, which is great, we can build on that momentum. Pacific nations share the USA's newly announced ambition to decarbonize shipping, for example, but we have much bolder blue ambitions. Regardless of our small carbon footprint, we are large ocean states entrusted with huge swathes of blue Pacific. Our governments and NGOs can work together to build a great blue Pacific wall of knowledge and experience in the sustainable management of coastal watersheds and ocean ecosystems. And the inescapable half of the climate adaptation, as mentioned earlier on, adaptation demands American leadership, innovation, ambition, and finance on a scale that more than compensates for the last four years. Since Winston, we've had 12 more cyclones that have struck Fiji, each one a devastating reminder of the damage to the climate that has already been done. We fully support the USA in holding major emitters accountable. But even if the global economy became carbon neutral tomorrow, we would still have to reckon with a range of water-related crises, from superstorms to the rising seas, to the changing weather patterns that kill off crops and still livelihoods of our farmers. Today, it is Pacific communities on the front lines of this emergency. Tomorrow, of course, it will be New York City, Houston, and Miami. This crisis is shared, as must be our solutions. And the USA can help build a more resilient world with an additional ambitious pledge to the GCF, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Mr. Secretary, backing climate for debt swaps and other actions to ease the COVID-driven debt burden on climate-vulnerable nations. Support for reforms to guarantee that processes for financing climate adaptation are far less bureaucratic and become more efficient to make finance more accessible and flexible. And by making good on the $100 billion pledge to mobilize climate finance. America still has the convening power. It has technology, it has wealth. It has founding principles that impel it to take on this challenge in the name of global economic growth and prosperity, in the name of humanity and all life that inhibits the, in, inhabits the planet. Together, we can harness the innovative climate solutions and ambition from all nations, including from the most vulnerable, and oversee the implementation of the structural and institutional reforms required to accelerate and scale these solutions to ensure we save the planet. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Naka. Thank you. Now we're gonna turn our attention to the impact of climate change that can result in water stressed countries. I'd like the opportunity to uh, have Malik Ami Aslam, Minister for Climate Change from Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Minister, my question to you is, what are your climate adaptation priorities, particularly in, when it comes to managing water scarcity in Pakistan? Bismillah rahman rahim Excellencies, Ministers, Aslam alaikum and good morning. I would like to first of all thank the U.S. government for convening this leaders' dialogue at a very critical time for our planet. Pakistan is a country which contributes less than 1% to the global emissions, but yet it is one of the countries which is on the top 10 list of most vulnerable countries because of our topography and our geography. We face the Himalayan glaciers, which are melting in the north of Pakistan, the arid zones of Pakistan, which are getting heat waves like never before, uh, cyclones in the south and sea level rise, and floods in the floodplains. 
all of these compendium of natural disasters, the frequency and the intensity of these disasters have gone up by climate change, and they are impacting 220 million people. So Pakistan is really at the forefront of this climate disaster. But yet we are a strong and resilient nation which is trying to cope with this disaster. In Pakistan, we are planting 10 billion trees and restoring over 1 million hectares of forest, including the mangroves in the south. Today, Pakistan is the only country in the world with an increasing mangrove cover. We are increasing our protected areas, and we are trying to use our flood water judiciously and effectively through the Recharge Pakistan Initiative, which is going to use this flood water to recharge our aquifer and also restore our degraded wetland systems. Also, Pakistan has committed itself to a green and a clean energy pathway. Although we can take the other route, which is a low-cost route, but it is a polluting route and harmful for the world. We have committed ourselves to 60% clean energy by 2030 and 30% electric vehicle transition by 2030. So Pakistan is clearly, clearly doing uh, more, more than its share for the climate change issue. Also, at the end, I would like to say that the world really needs to get off this war path with nature. This is not a sustainable pathway. It would only get us into further trouble. The world needs to do more on climate, act, climate change. It needs to do more on actual climate action and not just words. Action on the ground needs to be taken now. And the world needs to do more on climate finance. It needs to, needs to deliver climate finance for countries in energy transition like Pakistan, for countries who need to adapt again like Pakistan to climate change. And it needs to honor the commitment of $100 billion a year that has been promised on climate finance. I think the world does not have a choice but to go this pathway. And Pakistan is totally committed to an inclusive, cooperative, and collaborative pathway towards this end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's turn our attention now to the issue of food security in connection with climate change. I'd like to hear from uh, the Minister of Energy, Mines, and Environment in Morocco, Aziz Rabah. And the question I have for you, uh, Mr. Minister, is what are some of the strategies you all are considering in strengthening global food security in light of climate risk, and how can international trade play a role? شكرا على هذه الدعوة الطيبة وشكرا للولايات المتحدة الأمريكية على تنظيم هذه القمة فطبعا رغم أن بلادنا لا تساهم في انبعاثات الغاز الدفيئة إلا بحوالي 0.18% إلا أنها ليست في مأمن من تداعيات التغيرات المناخية هناك تأثر كبير جدا على مستوى الموارد المائية تأثر كبير على مستوى القطاع الفلاحي على مستوى الصيد البحري ثم أيضا تأثر كبير على مستوى المدن الساحلية وأيضا كل ما يتعلق بالتنوع البيولوجي والأوصاف الطبيعية بلدنا الحمد لله تحت المرتبة الثانية في التنوع البيولوجي على مستوى البحر الأبيض المتوسط ولكنها مهددة بسبب هذه التغيرات المناخية طبعا كما يعلم الجميع وخاصة الذين يتابعون تجربة الدول الصاعدة ومنها المغرب أنه الحمد لله بلادنا ملتزمة منذ مدة بمواجهة يعني كل ما يتعلق بالتغيرات المناخية وكل ما يتعلق بالبيئة ولذلك يعني عندنا استراتيجيات أفقية مثل الاستراتيجية الوطنية للتنمية المستدامة والتي تشمل كل القطاعات وكل المجالات التي نصت عليها أهداف التنمية المستدامة ثم أيضا استراتيجية طموحة في مجال الطاقات يعني المتجددة والتي أعطت نتائج كبيرة وكبيرة جدا سواء تعلق الأمر باستثمار عمومي أو استثمار وطني سواء من داخل الوطن أو من خارج الوطن لكن أيضا هناك مخططات لمواجهة تأثيرات يعني تغيرات مناخية على الجوانب المرتبطة بالأمن الغذائي أولا هناك مخطط كبير هناك استراتيجية كبيرة للماء 2020-2040 والتي ستطلب حوالي 40 مليار دولار يعني في العشرين سنة المقبلة ثوا من خلال هذه الاستراتيجية هناك مخطط قصير المدى لسبع سنوات تطلب حوالي يعني 12 مليار دولار يتعلق الأمر طبعا ببناء السدود 
يعني الكبرى والمتوسطه ثم ايضا بناء محطات لتحليه المياه باستعمال الطاقات المتجدده يعني في وخاصه ان الحمد لله بلادنا غنيه بشواطئها وبامكانيتها الطاقيه ثم ايضا استعمال المياه العادمه وهذا لكي نواجه الخصائص التي ستعرفه بلادنا في المستقبل فيما يتعلق بالماء سواء تعلق الامر بالماء الشروب او تعلق الماء الذي نحتاجه للفلاحه ولا سيما ان المغرب بلد فلاحي بامتياز هناك ايضا استراتيجيه جديده للقطاع الفلاحي يعني استراتيجيه جديده بعد النجاح في المخطط الاخضر للسنوات الماضيه الان عندنا استراتيجيه للعقد المقبل فيما يتعلق بالقطاع الفلاحي طبعا الهدف من منه هو ان نصل الى الامن الغذائي ان ان نساعد الفلاحه الاجتماعيه ان نساعد التنميه في المجال القروي في المجال الريفي ثم ايضا ان نستمر في تصدير الفلاحه الى الاسواق الدوليه والهدف طبعا هو الحفاظ على المياه وتثمين الري الموضوعي see the link between uh, climate change and uh, food security. We have a strategy in this regard for the fisheries sector. There are a group, a host of uh, uh, plans to protect the coastline. And we have a scheme also uh, for uh, natural resources and also for the forest uh, um, wealth. So we are trying to face uh, uh, deforestation in this area and in a sustainable way. Of course, uh, I have to also mention that the issue of climate change and its relationship to water or water security or food security or energy or the environment or natural uh, crisis, uh, which also have plans in place uh, to address at the national and in the local uh, levels. Uh, Morocco is uh, committed to work with international uh, committees and uh, organizations. We attend uh, summits and we'll have heavy prevents also at the COP26. Morocco has uh, uh, adop fully adopted this uh, summit. And uh, also in the previous summit, we launched a qualitative uh, um, uh, initiative to support agriculture in Africa, and we have many qualitative projects in this regard. There's also the blue, um, uh, the blue belt uh, initiative uh, to protect uh, our sea wealth. So we have several initiatives related to uh, uh, fragile areas, such as the Congo Basin and other areas in Africa related to water in Africa and clean energy to developing countries, especially African countries. Also at the national level and the international level, uh, Morocco is fully committed to help and to assist uh, world leaders in this regard. So we hope that uh, big countries will also be increase their contributions so that we can uh, develop a financing uh, mechanism and system that would help uh, countries face uh, this uh, climate change. So we have to strengthen the confidence and trust between developing countries and developed countries so that we can adopt a green uh, economy and address all problems facing uh, our, uh, di the different sectors. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, now I'd like to call upon uh, Varut Silpath Archa, Minister of Natural Resources and Environment for Thailand. Uh, Mr. Minister, as a member of ASEAN, uh, how has Thailand addressed the impacts of climate change, specifically on the issue of adaptation and food security, to better contribute uh, to the nations uh, and area of Southeast Asia and broader regions? part in this important event. Now for Thailand, along with half of the ASEAN or Southeast Asian nations, we are amongst uh, the top 20 most vulnerable to all this climate change scenario. Thailand, we are actually ranked number ninth on the sensitivity scales against the long-term effects such as coastal erosions, 
uh, drought, famines, floods, and so on. So the Royal Thai government has placed its most importance and we have committed our utmost effort in pursuing this climate resilience and committed to the low greenhouse gas development pathway. Now, in order to do so, our government has created a climate change master plan, which spanned from 2015 until 2050, which provides a, a long-term framework to guide our national along the climate change policies and strategies. And of course, the adaptation is among the three pillars of this strategy. The other two are the mitigation and enabling the environment. Now, along the national adaptation plan, we have developed to um, identify the areas on the, based on the risk and the vulnerability that uh, our country is facing. Our first ever Climate Change Act is actually along the way to be presented on the verge of being presented to the cabinet. And once it has been approved by the cabinet, it will gonna go through the, uh, the parliamentary session. And once it's been done, Thailand will have our first ever Climate Change Act. And this act will improve our THG emission data collection and transparency, and also uh, private sector engagement would participate along the way as well. It will also open up a new channel for allowing the financial support through the existing environmental funds to mobilize financial support for the local climate actions. Now, Thailand, as many people probably are aware, we are one of the largest um, uh, rice exporter in the world, cons uh, considering that 25% of our population are actually farmers. So we are also uh, facing a adverse impact from climate change, floods, extreme uh, drought, uh, and so on and so forth. So Thailand, we are implementing the sufficient economy philosophy which was pioneered and implemented by our late King Rama the Ninth. And it has been applied by the Ministry of Agriculture and as a guiding concept to build the climate resilient um, in the agricultural sector. By implementing His Majesty's philosophy, uh, the three principles of the moderation, prudence and social immunity in cooperating with the local wisdom would allow our farmers to move towards the um, uh, more sustainable agriculture and to improve the adaptive capability of our farmers. Um, in Thailand, Rice Nama is a good example for, of the project exhibiting the core benefit between mitigation and adaptation. With funding support from the Nama facility, uh, it will help to transform our rice industry from all the supply chain, from growing the industry and all the way to the table to become the low carbon production line. Now, Thailand in 2019, we chaired the ASEAN Chairmanship. And during that time, we acted as a lead country in climate change adaptation and initiated a uh, dialogue to identify the common risks amongst our neighboring countries and the ASEAN member states. And we will continue to do working closely with our member states to actually achieve the uh, climate change agendas. Now, bear in mind that having said all that, the international support in form of finance, technical transfer, as well as the uh, capacity building are essential to make sure that our adaptation actions are actually effective. Now, Secretary Vilsack and Honorable Ministers, we, Thailand will continue to work with our neighbors and international partners as the upcoming um, APEC in 2022, Thailand, which had the APEC in 2022, and rest assured that climate change is going to be amongst one of our top agendas, top priority for that session. Because in Thailand, we are developing a model of bio-circular green economy, or BCG. This model will truly make sure that from now on, we don't want to build back better. We want to build forward greener. Whatever we do from now on, ladies and gentlemen, it has to encompass around the word environment. We cannot afford to go back to the way we were. We cannot afford to do businesses and industry the way we used to do. We have to move forward and we have to make sure that it is greener because after all, in order for human, for the mankind to survive into the next century, we have to adapt to nature and not the other way around. So ladies and gentlemen, rest assured that Thailand stands firm in supporting the climate change actions and every facet of such issue.
because we do want to give this world to our future generation in a really nice and healthy form. So thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. Let's turn our attention now to another island nation. Uh, I would ask uh, Minister Ryan, who is the Minister for Environment, Climate and Communications and a Minister for Transport in Ireland. Uh, Minister, I, I wonder if you could speak to how Ireland's adaptation financing aims to help your small scale farmers and the sustainability of local ecosystems uh, and, and how you can create a more sustainable agricultural model. Be interested in your thoughts about that. Mr. Secretary, thank you. And uh, before I answer the question, can I just say firstly to thank President Biden for the leadership that's been shown today. And also it's just an opportunity to say that I think Ireland is also ready to step up to the plate. Uh, just yesterday, we introduced new climate legislation in our parliament, which commits us to climate neut neutrality by 2050 at the latest. And a 51% reduction in emissions by 2030 as the Paris Climate Agreement obliges us to do. We also want to help in every international effort to deliver on that agreement. We do so with a certain humility, recognizing how much we've yet to do. Also realizing that we're all frontline defenders in this challenge and that our security will only be guaranteed when our neighbor's security is also assured. And on Earth Day, recalling that when we say neighbor there, we mean every country, those living in every continent. That's the only way that this will work. Our international development policy have to, has to reflect that interconnection. In that context then, I'm glad that Ireland is, is setting aside 99% of our international climate finance, which is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly grant-based, to support adaptation by and with the most vulnerable who've contributed the least to causing climate change. And we're now seeking to at least double the percentage of our official development spending on climate finance by 2030. It's my key message here is that supporting climate adaptation and resilience in agriculture will be critical to achieving the ambitions of the Paris Climate Agreement. Can I agree with what I heard my Dutch colleagues say earlier, that adaptation and mitigation have to come together. It's one of the lessons I think we need to learn. Well-planned early adaptation saves money, protects nature, and helps to prevent disruption later. And we must continue to support local communities, including especially maybe small-scale farmers, to, to, to use land sustainably to protect, to protect and regenerate local ecosystems, which is both biodiversity as well as, to, as, as climate. The two crises go together. The solutions come together. This has relevance for my own country, where we have to protect our family farm system and also allow a new generation of young farmers earn a good living by restoring the natural world, as well as providing food for our people. Paying people, our farmers, properly for that is probably the first most important thing we need to do. That lesson equally applies to the least developed countries and small island developing states, where Ireland focuses its adaptation support. To give you an example, We've worked with small-scale farmers in Malawi over the last five years to develop over 20 new varieties of sorghum, millet, and groundnuts. We're 304,000 304, hectares of land have been cultivated using climate-smart agricultural practices, including, including nitrogen-fixing trees and conservation agricultural techniques. We seek the same land-based or nature-based solutions in our work with small island developing states, including through our support with the Asian Development Bank. We are members of the local 2030 Islands Network, which is the world's first global island-led network devoted to, devoted to advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals through locally driven, culturally oriented, informed solutions that build island resilience in food, water and energy systems. We look forward to working with many of you for a strong focus on nature-based solutions in the Food Systems Summit is due later this year. And we also hope to see progress on food systems transformations with small-scale farmers and the rural poor being put front and center, not just in Glasgow this November, but also in future COP events. Lastly, quality adaptation work that prioritizes nature-based solutions is not simply important for climate and biodiversity, 
Can I re reiterate what I heard the Pakistan minister saying just earlier? That this can also help build peace. This is essentially a peace project. This is the linkage which Ireland makes into our wider climate diplomacy work, including in our leadership role on the UN Security Council in the area of climate security. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn our attention now to uh, Qatar uh, and the Minister of Municipalities and Environmental Engineering, uh, Minister Al Sabai. Uh, Minister, you've been a uh, Qatar has been a leader in developing innovation uh, solutions to climate change. Uh, curious to know uh, your take on what innovative ways we can think of to build adaptation and resilience and how we might be able to build collaboration across sectors that aren't necessarily typically engaged with one another or with issues involving climate. Thank you, Secretary Vilzak. It's an honor to speak to you uh, all today. Climate change represents an acute generational challenge to all of us. This summit, this summit offers us an opportunity to decisively advance our collective efforts to help create a prosperous, sustainable future. Like other nations, our region is significantly impacted by climate change. From warmer temperatures to rising sea levels in our region, and we feel that we feel that we feel its effects directly. In Qatar, vulnerabilities exist in the water, agriculture sector, coastal zones, and marine environment. We are deeply committed to addressing that challenge. Environmental stewardship is one of the four main pillars of Qatar National Vision 2030, which forms the foundation of our plans for responsible development. We are mitigating emissions at home, both at the industrial facilities and the residential sector. Doha is, now, Doha is now home to among the highest concentrations of certified sustainable buildings anywhere on Earth. We are developing renewable energy sources, investing in research and creating an integrated solar industry. Qatar, now, Qatar is now on track to increase its solar capacity as much as fourfold by 2030. We are committed to responsibly developing our natural gas resources, aggressively working to minimize industry emissions and deploy carbon capture solutions in order to ensure we can sustainably continue to provide countries around the world with natural gas as lower pollution alternative to support their development. We will also host in 2022 the first ever carbon neutral FIFA World Cup to help demonstrate the, to the world the viability and benefit of net zero solutions. But nowhere have our efforts been more urgent than in agriculture, where before the 2017, Qatar was importing nearly 90% of its food supply, which has now changed. We have invested in domestic food production and technology, boosting Qatar to become one of the highest ranking countries in food security in the region. We rapidly rose to the challenge, deploying advanced farming technologies and a range of supply chain solutions to maximize efficiency, eliminate waste, and minimize water consumption. As a result of these efforts, we have almost doubled, doubled our local production capacity overall and have achieved full self-sufficiency self for several, several varieties of goods, all in a manner that improves the sustainability of our agriculture industry as a whole. Qatar recognizes that our efforts cannot stop at our own borders. Throughout its history, and particularly since hosting the Bivital Cup 18 conference in 2012, Qatar has consistently worked to engage internationally in, on, in climate change. Most recently, we committed 100 million US dollars to support, to support the small developing island state and the least developed states to deal with the climate change, which reflects Qatar's strong, Qatar strong belief in the important role everyone can play in addressing the phenomenon. Our international commitment is particularly strong in food security. Qatar founded the Global Dryland Alliance, an organization dedicated to developing and sharing best practices and technologies to help dryland nations, almost home to 2 billion globally. 
which creates integrated agriculture, water, and energy use strategies to achieve sustainable food security. Qatar Investment Authority, which invests in climate-related financing projects, is a founding and active member of the One Planet Sovereign Wealth Fund that emanated from the One Planet Summit held in 2017 in Paris. The fund aims to increase efficiency in allocating global capital in order to contribute to the smooth transition toward a more sustainable economy characterized by low carbon emissions. In 2019, Qatar made a 20 million US dollar contribution to the UNDP Accelerator Labs Network in 60 developing countries to tackle the world's most pressing sustainable development, development challenges. Qatar is also supporting sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, and food security in multiple countries where the effects of climate change are felt most acutely through, uh, which, uh, through an organization founded in 2008 called Celatic, committed to sustainable economic development. In Yemen, for example, Celatic is working with local organizations to install solar panels to power water pumps to help local farmers irrigate their farms year-round. In addition to reducing the climate impact of agriculture, this initiative has already created more than 12,000 jobs for Yemeni youth. In Somalia, Silatik is working with partners to train Somali youth in climate smart agriculture practices to reduce reliance on rainwater, an effort that will also support more than 15,000 jobs for young people in the country. In Qatar, we are confident that through the collective, collective actions, we can successfully navigate through this adversity in all its facets. In Qatar, we are committed to not simply slowing the effects of, like, of climate change, but to, building a strong, to build a stronger foundation for inclusive, sustainable global growth that will benefit all of us for decades to come. We are eager to work alongside each of you in this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We're now going to turn our attention to the human impacts of climate change, and we'll ask uh, the Minister of Environment, uh, Jean-Darc uh, Muja Wira uh, from Rwanda to speak uh, on the human impacts of climate change. Uh, Madam Minister, uh, let us uh, focus on this by, by giving us your, uh, your views about the increased prevalence uh, of how certain diseases or instability can often occur at the local level connected to uh, climate and how you are coordinating on a subnational uh, level with governing bodies to meet the adaptation needs of very vulnerable communities in Rwanda. Thank you. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vistak, Secretary of Homeland Security, Excellencies and Federal Ministers, Distinguished guests, all protocol observed. Happy Earth Day and greetings from Kigali, Rwanda. It's a, it's a pleasure to join this important summit and share Rwanda's effort in climate change adaptation and resilience. Thanks to the special US envoy, John Kerry, for convening this summit and Secretary Vistak for chairing this session. On Christmas Day in 2019, Wanda experienced a terrible rainstorm. The heavy rain flooded roads, destroyed bridges, demolished houses and crops. Tragically, 12 people lost their lives. Just two weeks earlier, the government had made the difficult but necessary decision to relocate people living in wetlands, especially in the capital city, Kigali. What happened on Christmas Day could have been much worse without the government decisive action. Hundreds of lives were saved. The challenge we now face is building resilience livelihood for those citizens while rehabilitating ecosystem. That is why we created the Rwanda Green Fund as a financing vehicle and catalyst for green investment to respond to the country's needs. The fund has approximately mobilized 
200 million USD, created 140,000 green jobs, protected and rehabilitated 30,000 hectares of watersheds and the water bodies. The government's leadership and the fund's investment inspired more than 40 green model villages countrywide, electric motors, and ecotourism sites creating, among others. These contribute to the health of people, the environment, and the economy. Upscaling such initiatives and diversifying sources of finance, including the carbon trading, and the private financial instruments is critical in implementing our ambitious NDCs. The pandemic has taught us that none of us is resilient until we all are. We are far too interconnected and interdependent to ignore the climate crisis we face, both as individual nations and as an international community. Thank you for your kind attention. Morocco is a challenge. Thank you, Madam Minister. Uh, last but certainly not least, I'm very pleased to have the Portuguese Minister of Environment and Climate Action, Jeho Pedro Dos Fernandes, with us today. Not only is Portugal a climate leader, but it's also spearheading uh, negotiations on the EU climate law and debate over the bloc's adaptation strategy. And it has an important role. Uh, he has an important role as president of the Council of the EU. Uh, the EU recently published an adaptation strategy that includes new action tracks uh, at the European level. So, Mr. Minister, I wonder if you could help us uh, by elaborating on what you uh, believe we will uh, be able to expect from the EU in this regard. And, can you share some of your own experiences at the national level in this field uh, on subnational levels as well? Dear Minister Tom Vizlak, uh, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for the invitation. And yesterday was really an important day for the European Union and also for Portugal. Because we reached an agreement on an ambitious climate law setting a net greenhouse gas emission reductions target of at least 55% by 2030 when compared to 1990, prioritizing emission reductions and the climate neutrality objective by 2050, aiming to achieve negative emissions thereafter. We reinforced the role of science with the establishment of an independent scientific advisory board, body and the use of greenhouse gas budgets to inform the proposal of an intermediated climate target to 2040. Furthermore, the law establishes adaptation as a key component of the long-term global response to climate change. It foresees the adoption of an EU strategy on adaptation and the adoption of member states' adaptation strategies and plans. The law enhances climate mainstream in sectoral policies, including through assessment of impacts and climate change related to risks and vulnerabilities into investment and planning decisions. Portugal was the first country in the world to commit to carbon neutrality in 2050, and therefore we are delighted that the agreement on the European climate law was achieved during our presidency of the Council. This is a crucial moment for Europe and for the world. I'm very pleased to be here today on a session dedicated to climate adaptation and resilience. Can I continue? Can I continue? Yeah, yes, you may. Please, please okay. do. So Portugal is committed on raising ambition on adaptation under our presidency of the European Council. We are fully committed to ensure that the EU continues to engage effectively in the various activities that pave the way to COP26 in Glasgow. The European Commission adopted a communication on a new EU adaptation strategy 
that provides a long-term vision for the EU to become a climate resilient society in 2050, namely by making adaptation action smarter, more systemic, faster, and aiming to stepping up international action. Our aim is to accelerate adaptation actions in different streams, such as nature-based solutions, and in different settings, either at local or individual level, towards just resilience. Picking up from the Portuguese context, adaptation is a central aspect of our policies with particular focus on territory and water management, as Portugal is one of the European countries most affected by climate change. For that reason, adaptation is also a key element of Portugal's recovery and resiliency plan to recover from the pandemic COVID-19. I'm proud of the progress made on building capacity on adaptive management at subnational level, where action is better fitted to the local circumstances. Currently, our territory is almost covered with subnational adaptation plans, and now we need to have a deep reflection on its governance frameworks. An important piece for this process will be the ongoing work on the National Roadmap for Adaptation, updating narratives supported by climate risk assessment. This roadmap will help us on in identifying investment needs and costs, including the costs of inaction. Strategic adaptation projects and measures will be identified to further support our adaptation policies on the ground. The cooperation with other countries, notably with African countries, will also be key to improve resilience. Tomorrow, Portugal will be hosting the EU-Africa Green Investment Forum to engage with local actors, debate new ideas and share solutions for the common problem of climate change in order to make countries more competitive and resilient. Portugal and the EU are ready to engage multilaterally to share our own practices and experiences and learn from others. There is no doubt that we need together to act now to avoid inaction costs <clears throat> and the worst impacts of climate change. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Minister, thank you very, very much. And uh, my thanks to each and every member of the panel today. Uh, I think we've identified that this is indeed a shared crisis and that we have a shared responsibility in meeting the crisis. The need for innovation as well as investment so that we can develop that transformed circular green economy that will provide economic opportunity and environmental security. Certainly appreciate the willingness of all to uh, stay with us today. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share uh, best practices today. And I look forward to continued conversations on this very important topic. I uh, hope to see uh, everyone at COP26. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon and welcome to the Nature-Based Solutions section of the White House Leaders Summit on Climate. I'm pleased to be leading this session from the homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people. As we discuss how to increase global ambition to address the climate crisis. In this session, we'll focus on the role of nature in keeping the goals of the Paris Agreement within reach. The impacts of greenhouse gas pollution from extreme storms and intense heat to sea level rise are having a devastating effect on our lands and oceans. At the same time, nature provides us with solutions to the climate crisis. Achieving net zero by 2050 will not be possible without nature. I learned my deep respect for the natural world from my dad, who always took me and my siblings outside to enjoy the outdoors, and even more profoundly in my grandparents' cornfield on the Pueblo of Laguna, where I learned how to interconnect, where I learned how interconnected the world is. The food we ate came from the plants we grew, which relied on the sun and the water from the river, and the river relied on snow in the mountains during winter. It was a lesson on how even the worms we were picking off the corn are connected in this natural system that supports all life. Nature has a critical role to play in improving our resilience to climate change and creating a thriving and sustainable economy. If we take care of our land, water, and wildlife, we can create millions of new jobs and generate billions of dollars in economic returns in the years to come. We know that healthy forests capture carbon and lock it away, that the ocean absorbs heat from human-caused warming, that wetlands create natural barriers to more frequent and intense storms, and that our communities rely on the resources from our Earth to thrive. The Biden-Harris administration believes that addressing climate change is not only a challenge, but also an opportunity to set our world on a path toward equity and prosperity. I'll share just a few examples of how we're committed to doing our part to promote natural climate solutions at home and globally. We're providing $34 million through a National Coastal Resilience Fund to support natural approaches to resilience through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and other public and private partners. Funded projects will restore ecosystems such as coral reefs and coastal wetlands to protect communities from climate impacts with engagement from community members, including in tribal, territorial, and historically underserved communities. We're getting started on the President's commitment to conserve 30% of lands and waters in the United States by 2030. This begins with engaging state, local, tribal, and territorial officials, fishers, farmers, ranchers, foresters, private landowners, and other key stakeholders in shaping an inclusive and inspiring conservation vision that benefits all people internationally. We're supporting partnerships like USAID's Natural Infrastructure for Water Security Initiative with Peru and Canada, which works with water utilities to promote investments in natural infrastructure, ancestral water management systems, and human capital to increase the stability and predictability of water supplies. We are accelerating public and private investment in natural climate solutions through USAID, which will conserve, manage, and restore forests and other lands to meet Paris Agreement targets and increase global investments and new programs in Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Mexico, India, and Indonesia. We are supportive of proposals to protect the Southern Ocean through the three marine protected area proposals under the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And as you heard earlier today from our counterparts in the United Kingdom, we're launching the LEAF Coalition that will contribute more than $1 billion to tropical forest protection to help achieve net zero emissions globally by 2050. It will take all of us working together and with nature to address the threats that climate change poses to our world and to build a more sustainable future for generations to come. It's now my honor to introduce the panelists who will be participating in our discussion on how each of our countries is working to support nature-based solutions. Minister Wilkinson from Canada. 
Minister Meza from Costa Rica, Minister White, Gabon, Minister, Minister Panjatan, Indonesia, Minister Kihandria, Peru, Minister Joubert, Seychelles. General Coordinator, Tuntiak Katan with the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Archana Soreng, member UNSG's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. We're very pleased to have all of you here to help us consider what a net zero, fully resilient world will look like in 2050. We are also looking forward to your insights and perspectives on what we must do by 2030 to make net zero possible and how your countries have already implemented nature-based solutions. I'd like to first ask Minister Meza. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Holland and President Biden for organizing this summit and particularly for organizing this breakout session on nature-based solutions. Um, we have been hearing how nature is critical to address the health crisis we are facing, but also biodiversity and climate crisis. We need this integrated approach where nature-based and ocean-based solutions are key components to achieve the Paris goals. Um, but we need to also recognize that nature is an asset. The nature also provides welfare, but also economic growth. And I will say that my country, Costa Rica, has proven that this is a pathway for a robust economy. A recent report um, evidenced that our protected areas, that our national parks, have provided financial benefits of over $2 million in 2018 alone, which represents almost 3% of our GDP. As you have noticed, when we created our national park system, we also catalyzed a new industry, with, which is tourism. And we have managed through this integrated approach to stop deforestation, but at the same time increase our income, our per capita income. So I will say that this is a, a clear vision and this is why we are including nature and ocean-based solutions in our long-term strategy, in our decarbonization plan, but also in our enhanced NDC, because we really believe that this is part of this solution. And we strongly support multilateralism and it is so good to see United States back on this track. And for this reason, we also launched the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. This is a science-based coalition co-chaired by Costa Rica, France, and the UK as an ocean co-chair that now have more than 16 to regional countries. And the coalition uh, focuses its efforts on the protection of 30% of planets, land, and ocean by 2030. So I will say that this is how this future looks like. We need to protect 30% of land and ocean in 2030. This is a concrete goal. And it is also so good to hear that the US is also committed at the national level with this goal. And we need action. It is not only about commitment. And for this reason, we're also uh, included and in working with our indigenous people and local communities. And we also think that they should be part in the creation of these protected areas. And of course, in their management, we are seeing, we are hearing, they have this knowledge, they are the stewards of these natures. And it is so important to also include them when we are talking about crea creation and protection of new um, protected areas. But we also want to walk the talk. And for this reason, Costa Rica is working in increasing it's marine protected areas, MPAs, that right now we're having 2% of these to 30% in this year. And this is something that it, we see, it is very ambitious, ambitious, it's a huge task, but we're taking this with responsibility because we know that this is a decisive decade. One element that I would like to highlight is the importance of mobilizing more resources towards 
nature. And for this reason, we welcome the launch of the LIFT Coalition, especially the timely results-based finance windows, which provides necessary support for countries with high ambition like ours. Thank you, Secretary. I will leave my reflections here and I'm very open and, and enthusiastic in hearing the views of the other panelists. Thank you so much, Minister. That is incredible. Now I'll turn to Minister Flavian Jouvert of Seychelles, who provided recorded remarks for our session on how blue carbon ecosystems have been a priority for his country, as have marine protected areas, which are often referred to as a triple win, providing climate, biodiversity, and food benefits. We'll turn to that video now. Excellencies, I am honored to participate in this panel with other leaders from around the world. Seychelles is a large oceanic state, reliant on the ocean for many things, including our food security, economic livelihoods, and preserving our cultural traditions. We are also rich in marine biodiversity. Our waters support some of the largest and most biologically diverse marine ecosystems on the planet. Because of this, and to strengthen ocean biodiversity, conservation, resilience, sustainability, and productivity, Seychelles is currently protecting 30% of its EEZ, an area of some 400,000 square kilometers as marine protected areas, which is nearly six times the size of the Republic of Ireland. The high biodiversity or nautic zones alone are the size of Great Britain. The Seychelles marine protected areas has achieved the 30 by 30 or 30% 30 by 2030 goal in 2020, which scientists say is crucial to safeguard marine wildlife and help mitigate the impacts of climate change a decade early. Despite being the least, the least responsible for climate change, but the most vulnerable to, and often suffering the most from it, Seychelles as a seed is resiliently leading by example. That in itself, strengthens our ocean's capacity to act as one of the planet's most effective carbon sinks. Seychelles is increasingly investing in ecosystem restoration or nature-based solutions while transitioning to more sustainable tourism and fishing. It helps raise Seychelles' climate ambition by being a leader in ocean climate action through ecosystem-based adaptation or nature-based solution to climate change. Seychelles is looking at ways to further champion the ocean. And Blue Carbon, in, in its revised and ambitious nationally determined contributions, or NDC, under the Paris Agreement. We are dedicating a whole chapter of our NDC to ocean climate action and Blue Carbon as nature-based solutions to climate change. Our revised and ambitious NDC is looking at seagrass meadows, coastal wetlands, and corals, which are critical carbon sinks known as blue carbon ecosystems and as nature-based climate solutions. These absorb more carbon per unit area than terrestrial forests, playing a substantial role in mitigating climate change. Coastal wetlands also provide adaptation benefits, including buffering the shoreline and coastal communities against storms and flooding. We need to protect these natural carbon sinks at all costs. Yet, these ecosystems have not been afforded the same attention as their terrestrial counterparts. It should be noted, however, that we devise innovative conservation finance models, including a debt for adaptation swap targeting the ocean, as well as the world's first blue bonds to achieve these essential protections for our marine and coastal areas. We are putting in place protections, including but not limited to the ongoing marine special planning process and marine protected area network. For at least 50% of Seychelles seagrass and mangrove ecosystems by 2025, and 100% of seagrass and mangrove ecosystems by 2030, subject, of course, to external support. We intend to regulate coastal planning and coastal infrastructure at the national and local level to prioritize the consideration of blue nature-based solutions and to achieve the country's NDC commitments. These contributions are clear and transparent and help Seychelles to reach its expressed NDC targets by 2025 and 2030. For this reason, 
ocean conservation is a key priority for our government as we look to address the climate crisis. I thank you. That's great news from Seychelles. Now to General Coordinator Tuntiak Katan with Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Mr. Katan, as implementation of nature-based solution grows, what role can indigenous peoples play in addressing climate change and how can knowledge and participation be supported? Un saludo a todos. Eh, primeramente, agradecer por la to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank President Biden and uh, for his invitation. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and to all of our panelists. My greetings to you from our alliance, which is made of, up of indigenous peoples in the Amazon, Indonesia, Mesoamerica, and a part of the Congo Basin. The issue of nature-based solutions is a crucial issue from indigenous peoples, these organizations of the Global Alliance. We have in our power 800 million hectares of tropical forests worldwide, which makes up almost 80% of U.S. 80% of the size of the U.S., it's crucial for us to discuss this because we think that nature-based solutions also must go hand-in-hand hand with community-based solutions. I'm talking about communities, indigenous communities, local communities, and urban communities as well, of course. Therefore, as custodians or as stewards of forests worldwide in order to be more included in climate solutions. We require mainly that of these 800 million hectares, 50% 50 per, 50 of them are not legally recognized. So the first step is recognition of land rights. The second step is recognition of the contributions of local communities and indigenous communities, meaning the con contributions of indigenous peoples with their forests and land, the contribution to mitigation, to reducing the effects of climate change. We also need recognition of traditional knowledge and practices in order to fight climate change. What does this mean? Adaptation and the resilience of indigenous peoples who historically have been saying that the way we act as people, as humankind and our economic policies in the world are not the right ones. It's great. It's such a good thing that right now, President Biden and many world leaders are thinking about this and putting serious change on the table. Now, we must start to carry out specific real actions, such as restoring lands, mitigating climate change, pretend, pr protecting watersheds, which are practically some of the only ones left on the planet. And therefore, I say to you, my colleagues on this panel, that indigenous peoples are the solution, and we have been historically. Science is proving now that we have been right, and therefore I invite President Biden and global leaders who were a part of this event, I say to you that it is your within your responsibility and political will to change this trajectory of destruction and climate collapse on the planet. We as indigenous people are here, we are willing, we have been ready historically demanding that actions change. And we must stop the killing, the persecution of indigenous peoples and stewards of forests who are protecting forests, seas, fresh water. I, I 
extend my greetings to you. I commend you for this initiative. My greetings to all ministers who are here so that we may begin to fight this together to tackle this challenge. Why? Because if we start acting now, we save ourselves. It's not a matter of saving animals or the planet. Rather, we will be saving humanity. Therefore, we must work directly with organizations, with the structures of the indigenous movement at the national level, but also at the international level. My greetings to all of you, and the solution lies in all of us and in all of you. Thank you very much. I'm incredibly happy that you're here to highlight that perspective, Mr. Katan. Thank you so much. Now to the United States neighbor to the north, Minister Wilkinson. The Canadian government stated that investing in nature is one of the most affordable and effective climate actions governments can take. How is Canada investing in natural climate solutions and where do you see future opportunities? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Secretary Holland, um, and uh, merci de me donner la, la chance uh, de vous parler aujourd'hui. I am joining you from North Vancouver, which is on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil First Nations. I don't think we can say this often enough. Nature is certainly under threat due to climate change, but nature is also our very best ally in the fight against this crisis. We are in a somewhat uh, unique position. Canada is a G7 country that is both an industrial emitter and has some of the world's largest carbon stocks in nature. And we Canadians have set ambitious climate change goals, and including the, the new NDC announced this morning, 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030 en route to net zero by 2050. We also have a parallel and a complementary commitment to protecting 25 percent of our land and oceans by 2025 and 30% by 2030. Our climate goals depend on us addressing the full carbon cycle and protecting nature. And nature is our ally. It absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. It can protect, uh, protecting intact nature in, uh, ensures that carbon is not released. And, uh, and thirdly, it's also an essential buffer to adapt to climate change. Mais les cibles ne remplacent pas les actions. Avant tout, il faut assurer la santé de tous les écosystèmes qui sont à la base de la vie. This, uh, this week, we introduced the federal budget, which committed an additional historic $4 billion for land and ocean protection to get us to our 2025 target. I'm happy to say this budget also recognizes the very central role of Indigenous-led conservation and Indigenous Guardian programs to our progress. As we work with our American partners on Indigenous-led conservation, part of the Biden-Trudeau roadmap, we look forward to collaborating on a North American perspective. We also recognize that this is a global challenge that requires global leadership and that will guide our cooperative investments in nature-based solutions in developing countries. We must ensure our financial system has incentives to protect intact carbon and biodiversity-rich natural areas. Protecting carbon-rich natural systems is certainly good for nature, for the climate, and for people. It is the first, most effective, and lowest-cost nature-based solution. We will all get past this pandemic, but we face an unprecedented global crisis owing to the rapid decline in biodiversity and the impacts of climate change. Together, they threaten our economy, our food security, our health, and our quality of life. We certainly need to enlist allies to secure resources and all to work together to build a nature-positive, carbon-neutral future for everyone. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Minister, for sharing those valuable insights. Young people have been ringing the alarm on the climate crisis and will be critical partners to continue raising awareness. Archana Soreng, can you share with us how the movement Young People Started can help with the implementation of nature-based solutions? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow young people following us online, Johar. I would like to thank President Joe Biden, Mr. John F. Kerry, Presidential Envoy on Climate, Secretary Dave Halland for the kind invitation to address this leadership summit on climate on the theme of nature-based solution. We young people across the globe 
are at the forefront of climate justice movement and have been advocating for the health of nature over development at global, national and local levels. Whether in the streets or decision making spaces, we are leading the way and holding the world leaders accountable to achieve the goals of Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development. In the field of education, technology, science, law, art, music, fashion, entertainment, food, sports, and many more, we are making a difference through our skills, expertise, and contributing towards climate action. We know this as truth. And we also know that you are aware that we can play a crucial role in advocating for nature-based solutions. However, we are facing challenges and difficulties for the role we know we can lead. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share how we can move forward. We need you to prioritize protection and meaningful leadership of young people with the guiding principle of intergenerational and intersectional equity while adopting nature-based solution along with creating job opportunities for the young people. Mass climate education incorporating indigenous worldview should be core to nature-based solution. Nature-based solution should recognize and support the traditional knowledge and practices of indigenous youth and promote their forest-based livelihood. The support received from the young people, particularly from the marginalized and indigenous communities should not be taken for granted. Young people who are affected by climate crisis are on the front lines, but not on the front page. Thus, we need you, the leaders, to invest in adaptation, resilience, and deliver on climate finance promise of $1 billion per year. Excellencies, many of my peers across the world have been targets of human rights violation and systematic racism. This has to stop. Being an indigenous young woman, at this leadership summit, I would like to emphasize that we are not mere part of nature. We are nature. Nature is a source of identity, culture, tradition, and language. Nature-based solution can be effective when our rights over our land, forest, and territories are recognized and enforced and when we are ensured the right to refuse to the so-called developmental projects, which adversely affects us. Free prior and informed consent of the indigenous, traditional and local communities should be the core to nature-based solution and climate policies through a participatory and binding way. Before I end my intervention, I would like to emphasize that nature-based solutions cannot be used as the substitute for emission reductions. Countries should ramp up climate action and work towards net zero emission by 2030 and not 2050, and ensure that there is just transition in this process. Moreover, nature-based solutions Solution should not be marred with greenwashing and monoculture schemes. Prioritizing justice and well being of both nature and people should be the foundation stone as we move forward from today. I would like to end by saying that we youth offer our passion, zeal, commitment, and expertise in order to work together with you. Ensure that we have a seat at the decision-making table. Include us, support us, and protect us. We need to act now. Thank you. Thank you, Archana. That was wonderful. Hearing from young people always gives me hope. 
I'm just incredibly sorry that people your age have to worry about this crisis and that my generation didn't do a better job mitigating it. Now we're pleased to give the floor to Minister Luhut of Indonesia, who has provided his remarks from across the globe discussing the roles that tackling deforestation and restoring blue carbon ecosystems play in reducing greenhouse gas pollution and building resilience. Mr. Joe Biden, the President of the United States of America, distinguished ministers, it is such an honor for me to join this prestigious forum, even though we only meet virtually. I also would like to thank Secretary Kerry for the invitation. Indonesia takes action to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural resources. The forest area in Indonesia is 94.1 million hectares, or 50.1 percent of the total land area, and the forestry sector contributes 17.2 percent out of 29 percent target in our NDC. We have taken several co corrective measures to reduce emission from deforestation and enhance carbon stocks through forest and land rehabilitation. President Jokowi has issued a presidential decree to permanently freeze new licenses for logging and pitland utilization since 2019. Indonesia deforestation rate has decreased sharply in recent periods, and in 2020, the reduction reached 82 percent. And the trend of deforestation based on previous years tends to be stable. We have also controlled and reduced forest and land fires. The strategies for these measures are through prevention, firefighting, post-fire efforts by involving the government workers and communities surrounding areas. We train members of communities, around 12,994 people, to become forest fire guard brigade to control and extinguish hotspots and fires. In July 2020, we succeeded in limiting cases of forest fire by only 64,602 hectares. This number decreased compared to the same period in previous year, which amounted to 170,000 hectares. Indonesia stores almost 17 percent of the total global blue carbon storage. This is a significant amount and cannot be underestimated coastal resilience is essential for Indonesia. One of the efforts to improve it is uh, through the mangrove rehabilitation program. Indonesia has 3.31 million hectares of mangrove areas, which represent 20 percent of the world mangrove. The government of Indonesia has a rehabilitation mangrove program that covers 620,000 hectares of critical land areas. We target to rehabilitate 150,000 hectares all over Indonesia this year. And by 2024, all necessary areas have been planted by mangroves. The program is not only concerned about the environment, but also about improving the community's welfare. Also, strengthen adaptive capacity and expand land cover that could contribute to greenhouse gas emission reduction. The government of Indonesia is currently actively building food estate where we'll cooperate, incorporate green technology, apply the newest precision agriculture technology to minimize agriculture waste, excessive use, fertilization, and others while maximizing crop production. This will lead to more jobs, better income for the farm, farmers, as well as rural development. Additionally, in central Kalimantan, we combine dual goals to improve the fertility of peat soil for more uh, profitable agriculture. At the same time, also control wildfire that can release a substantial amount of CO2 that to the atmosphere through applying extensive water management intervention. This year, we transformed the grasslands into fertile agriculture land 
for potato salads and garlic in North Sumatra. Lastly, Indonesia will be chair of G20 in 2022 and ASEAN in 2023, and we have, and we will prioritize climate change and support emerging economies and developing countries to achieve global climate ambition. We are looking for further uh, collaboration with the U.S. for climate action and other countries across the G20 and ASEAN to achieve a common goal. Thank you very much. It's great to hear Indonesia's perspective on collaboration. There are many lessons to be learned from that approach. Minister White, Gabon has long been a champion of the protection and sustainable management of forests and marine ecosystems. As you look to the role these ecosystems play in Gabon's long-term climate strategy, what domestic partnerships will be important to fully deploying nature-based solutions? And how do you envision international partnerships supporting nature-based solutions in Gabon? Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Harlan. And good evening, fellow ministers, ladies and gentlemen, bonsoir. Gabon is a high forest, low deforestation, HFLD country, with less than 0.1% annual deforestation. Like other Congo Basin forests, our intact and log forests absorb four times more CO2 annually than our total emissions across all sectors. As a country with 88% forest cover, the forest is our home, our temple, our larder, our medicine cabinet, and our bank. Unless we can craft a national development strategy based on sustainable principles and maintaining natural capital, we will inevitably lose our forests. And as President Bongo said earlier today, if we lose the Congo Basin forests and turn them into CO2 emissions, we can forget the pathway to a 1.5 degree world. We will be heading um, towards a three or four degree world or worse. Our solution is to harness the power of nature and especially one of our renewable resources um, in the forests, our beautiful, precious hardwood. Using selective harvesting, cutting only two trees per hectare every 25 years, we can exploit the forests, but also maintain their carbon stocks. If we adopt a circular economy, transforming our wood into finished or semi-finished products in country, rather than exporting logs, we can create hundreds of thousands of jobs and thereby develop a constituency of young forestry professionals who know that their livelihoods are fundamentally linked to the survival and sustainable management of the forests. To achieve this, we need international private sector investment in modern timber processing. We offer enticing fiscal packages to companies interested to help save the Congo Basin forest through sustainably, sustainable forestry. We know that to thrive, our forest industry will have to be legal, sustainable, carbon and biodiversity positive, and socially responsible. We are looking for like-minded industrial partners. We have made a commitment to sustainability on land and at sea. We are working with National Geographic explorer Enrique Sala to optimize marine carbon sequestration by improving technology in our fishing fleet, avoiding bottom trawling, and creating marine protected areas. We are committed to creating 30% protected areas on land and sea by 2030. We believe we do have a model to harness the power of nature for both development and climate stabilization. Thank you. Thank you, Minister White, for sharing those informative thoughts and experiences. Our final discussion point will be on mitigation and adaptation. Minister Kihandria, as an Amazon Basin country, Peru is one of the most diverse regions in the world. As Peru develops its national climate change strategy, what role will nature-based solutions play 
particularly in regards to mitigation and adaptation measures. Thank you very much, Secretary Harlan. This is the real deal. ¿Y por qué estamos aquí? Por, porque estamos queriendo enviar un mensaje desde un punto que es reconocido como la cúspide del desarrollo de la civilización andina. Una civilización caracterizada por su capacidad para el desarrollo de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza. Es precisamente lo que estamos discutiendo el día de hoy. La cultura andina mantiene esa capacidad. De hecho, el día de hoy, buena parte de nuestras eh, comunidades originarias mantienen las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza como parte de su acervo de soluciones a, te, a problemas de desarrollo, a problemas de bienestar. Y en ese sentido, desde el Estado peruano, And queremos Perú wants to acknowledge this role that nature plays and that is very important in a country similar to ours. Therefore, we have been working in different processes. First, in to establish a, a framework for to approve the framework of uh, climate change in 2018, to have the national adaptation plan that now is being sent to Congress and basically is an um, adaptation based in ecosystems. And we want those issues to be the guiding uh, road. And therefore, we can see that in our um, updated NDC and about 21% of the measures will be able to be characterized as sol solutions based in nature, of course, taking into account the soil and uh, the right way of management um, forest. We are also working in our national strategy for climate change that will determine the guidelines that will allow us to be uh, carbon neutral in 2050 and will allow us to increase our resilience vis-a-vis -vis the risks of climate change. And therefore, we will be able to generate this framework to have uh, initiatives to conservation, recuperation of a forest, to recover wetlands, uh, similar what Indonesia just uh, mentioned, and see how we can work in the restorations of systems that produce water. For example, Secretary Haaland mentioned that we will be working with Canada and the U.S. in this project. So what we're trying to do is, is see how nature can produce enough water to be able to satisfy the city of Lima with 10 million people and a city that is um, placed in one of the driest deserts of the world. And therefore, we have to think about the uh, forests that cover about 40% of our territory. And we, you can see here in our area, in the Andes, uh, meet the Amazon. We are the second country in the world with a forest coverage after Brazil. And we are the ninth uh, in the world uh, order. And therefore, it's our big responsibility. And therefore, the solutions based in nature linked to forests are very important to us. They are very important. Why? Because we have a lot of potential, but also they are linked to trying to solve the f issue of reducing the uh, production of our uh, CO2 uh, gases. So therefore, we look for 
uh, how to sustain the forest and we have to understand that not only it helps with absorbing CO2, but also uh, for fosters biodiversity and also regulates the level of the rain and the level of the river. So as I said, this is a complete package. This is a tool that will allow us to resolve not only environmental issues, but also development and issues because we are sure that those are linked. And therefore, our work now is centered into how to work with a different sort of forest that we have in our country. And we are working in an initiative that is pay per result that we work together with uh, Norway. And it seems that the US and UK would like to join us in this effort. We are trying to see how we can renew it because the first uh, stage has already been completed. So for us, it's uh, very, very good. And we are very hopeful that new initiatives will be launched because this will allow us to reach the goals that we have um, committed uh, um, goals to technology, technical assistance, but also financing, because that is a key issue. Financing that has to come not only from international community, but also the private sector. This is something that we are working on in Peru right now. And also the public financing that has to change the way it works. It has to see nature as a very important actor. In the last months in Peru, we have been talking about nature is coming back. That's our logo. And I think that that logo is something that is very important. And I hope that the new government that will take over uh, July 29th, uh, we hope that they will maintain this. And therefore, we will continue uh, understanding that nature has a key role. It's not a rival. It's not something that we have to dominate. It's our ally. It will allow us a better well-being, our survival. And therefore, that is what is in danger right now. And we see that we are always uh, un a crisis like COVID or some of the other ones that we might be able to see in the future. Thank you so much. Minister Kehendria, that's amazing. And I know that we can learn so much from the indigenous peoples of Peru who continue to live traditionally using nature as their guide to plant their crops, gather water, and pass down their knowledge to future generations. I want to thank all of you for joining this session today and sharing your tremendous insights with us. My Pueblo upbringing taught me that we have an obligation to protect each other and work together so that everyone can thrive. I learned something from each one of you today and I want to be a resource for all of you as we continue to work together on nature-based solutions that will ensure we have a sustainable, and equitable future. I encourage everyone to join the closing remarks for the day by Special Envoy John Kerry, and thank you all so much again.